And in James 3, 13 through uh, 4 and verse 4, we learned, among other things, a lot of things, that we, we, you, me, we are the source of quite uh, uh, fights and quarrels. That we cannot blame anybody else. That we cannot blame our temperament or our moods. We can't blame the other person at all. We cannot blame the world. It is when we are worldly and we're living by worldly wisdom, then we will not, we will not, we will not ever get along with people like we need to in the body of Christ and anywhere else. And so we actually uh, are told by James that our sinful desires, those things that consume us, sinful desires, it's not sinful desires of all these pretty things that you want that you can't have. A sinful desire is, I want to I'm gonna give, that, give it to that person. I want to I want, to, I want to just let them know how I really feel when I'm angry. Those types of sinful desires, when those get the best of you, then the relationships in the beautiful family of God are going to be few and far between. They're not going to be as strong as they need to be. In the church, they're supposed to be beautiful. We can actually destroy the fellowship and the family that Jesus died to provide for us in His church, in His body. And so James teaches that this ungodly behavior uh, today, what we'll see, is it comes from our pride. Our pride. Now he doesn't talk about pride, not writing about pride uh, in that, that overt sense. He is going to talk about the opposite of pride so much that you know that's what is being talked about because he is going to bring humility into it. How do you get along with people? Be humble yourself. Be humble, and it will bless your relationships. And so the text today, James 4, 5 through verse 12, we're going to see how to stop quarrels and fights before they even start. And that's better than just being behind the, behind the eight ball or be behind the curveball in these things. It's better to be proactive in this rather than simply reactive because that's where we have the problems. We don't react well a lot of the times. Now, I can say that with assurance because it affects me that way. I, I don't think I'm the only one that doesn't always respond well and react well. Now, how do we overcome this tendency, this sin? How, how do we do this? How do we have God-glorifying marriages, the relationships, right, that are important, God-glorifying marriages, God-glorifying relationships, God-glorifying church family relationships, and God-glorifying worldly relationships, meaning outside the body of Christ, at work, at school, and perhaps even in your own family. How do you do this? Well, it has a starting point. And, you know, like it normally is with God, there is a basic understanding, a basic mindset, a basic teaching that is meant to, uh, to, for us to adopt. And if we do, the subsequent things that we add to it will bring the blessing, help us improve. And the very first one of these eight things is none of this is going to happen unless we submit to God. We must submit to God. Verse 7. Let, well, let's, let's read 5 through 7, I guess. Chapter 4, starting in verse 5. He writes, Or do you think the Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely, but He gives us more grace? That is why the Scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Submit yourselves then to God. There's more, but just start with this one right here. Submission. When you submit yourself to God, you are giving yourself over to the leadership of God in your life. 
You are giving yourself over to the, the one who you want to rule your life, to guide your mind and your steps. That is what submission means. The attitude that James is requiring of the churches that are struggling in this area is based on the belief that God's way is always right. Now, in the context, it is on the way we treat one another and how we get along with one another in this arena of the church where there are, uh, there are fights and quarrels. We must first submit ourselves to God. That means you submit yourself to what is right in the eyes of God. Submission, therefore, means submitting to God's word, submitting to God's will, Submitting to God's way in the relationships that he puts in our, in our life. And so when we submit to these things, we are more likely to not just get along with the people that we have the most in common with, but maybe to the people that we find ourselves at odds with, even inside the church. So submitting to God then is a recognition of his right, God's right to lead me. God demands that I conform to his will. And when I do this one thing, begin right here in this one way, then I will know how to treat people. And I will know how to deal with people, especially when things get hot or when I am upset or when things don't go my way or when I want and do not have because I haven't asked, as we heard uh, Mark read to us just a little bit ago. But that's not all. Beyond that, that's just the first step. When I submit myself to God, I'm going to have the wherewithal to, to actually uh, uh, go head to head, if you will, with the one who is taking advantage of my weaknesses my propensity to, to be at odds with people, perhaps. That's, again, the context of this. So not only do we submit to God then, we also must resist the devil all at the same time. All at the same time. Verse 7 continues, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now again, we cannot blame the devil for this problem. This is all on us. But the devil is in there taking advantage of our weaknesses, our human way, unfortunately, uh, of, of not getting along with people the way that we should. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist here means simply take a stand or make a stand. Not against the person, not against your rights or your understanding or your will or your way. It is to take an active stand resisting the devil's temptations and lies. You know those lies like, you know, Barry, you're right and he's wrong. Give it to him. Come on, just resist. How often do we get ourselves in trouble when we don't fight those urges and those temptations and those lies that Satan tells us, well, you know, they had it coming to him anyway. Now that sounds very worldly, doesn't it? And that's the point of James' writing. They are worldly thinking. It is, it is uh, a, a worldly mindset that has overtaken them. He wants them to go back to a godly mindset in all these things. The purpose, now if you think about the devil's purpose right here, the purpose of the devil is not simply to make you do what you don't want to do. What the devil here is doing and what he does to us is basically the same thing that we saw when he took Jesus out and tempted him after his baptism. The purpose of the devil's tempting of our Lord uh, when he took him out into the, de into the desert was to divert Jesus from submission to his father's will to get him to do his own thing and to have his own way and to think only of himself and in this way give himself over, not submitting to God's will, but submitting to Satan's will. Don't play Satan's game. 
don't let him lie to you and try to trick you into thinking that, that how you treat people and how you talk to people and, and the quarrels that come out of all this, that this isn't a big deal and these are okay in the body of Christ. It's never right. It is never good for anybody. What did Jesus do? Jesus resisted. Jesus remembered the words of God. Jesus stood firm on what he knew was right, what was right in the eyes of God. Jesus submitted to God, his will, his word, and his plans, and actually quoted God's word in defense of his very spiritual life. And so just like he did, uh, just like Jesus did, When we submit, the devil will flee. He will flee if we submit to God and actually resist. You ever have to resist saying it? You just want to clamp your mouth, cover your mouth, walk away, not say what you're thinking or give in to what you want to say or do. Whatever it is, it's worth it. It is worth it for that active resistance in your life. Now, Kate, there's only two. Tell me you won't bless your marriage and your friendships and a church and your relationships with people in the world if you do just those two things. I'm going to submit to God in all things and especially in my relationships. I'm going to resist Satan so he gets out of my life and gets out of my marriage, gets away from this church and out of my relationships with my friends. Just these two things. And you can see how we'll be blessed. Well, we have six more to go. Number three, come near to God. Verse eight says, come near to God and he will come near to you. I feel very safe in saying that if we have an issue where we are argumentative or we are quarrelers or we have this desire to to fight for things, our own will, our own way, whatever it is, even when we really think it's important and we really think that we're right, I feel very strongly in saying we're probably not as close to God and His Word and His will as we need to be or as we think we are. Why else would He say in quarrels and fights and all these things that are going on and all this worldly wisdom that's messing the church up, why would He say, come near to God and He will come near to you because they are not near to God? They are not close to God as they need to be. The devil, uh, we know, when Jesus was tempted, he went away from the Lord. uh, And he intent on coming back. We know he did uh, a time or two in Jesus' ministry. The devil went away from the Lord. Uh, But in our life, we must move toward the Lord always. As fast as we can and to get there and to stay there. That close relationship with the Lord. Resisting the devil is more than just avoiding evil and overcoming temptations. That's not what this means. That's simply called morality. Coming near to God, therefore, is more than just moral living. It is the direction of our life. Always near God. Always getting closer, closer and closer and closer. Keeping in step with God, keeping in step with the Spirit, staying on the right path. A lot of metaphors in the Bible about this. My friends, we need to be that close to God. It is a right that we have in Christ. Do you understand one of the things that when it talks about the idea of coming near or coming near to God, you want to get your, your concordance. And just look up, it's about 27, 28 times in the Bible where it says come near or coming near. The majority of those things are in the context of coming near to God in worship and in relationship because you are God's people. I have the right to walk with God because I am in His Son. And so since I have that right and that ability, I need to take advantage of it. Get near to God and stay near to God. That is what we do. There is a great benefit in this. Do you realize that the closer we stay to God, that, you know, that word basically is called fellowship. It's a relationship, a spiritual relationship that you have with no one else 
without the Spirit. That's the relationship. It's called fellowship. That's the close relationship between God and the Christian. And when God and the Christian are close together, what you receive is the continual cleansing of your sin and, and, and the things that we need to fight the devil and resist him. John wrote, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of His Son, Jesus, purifies us from all sin. That's because you're close. And you stay with Him. And you keep in step. When you submit to God while you resist the devil, and you submit to God because you're close to Him, it says God will be near to you as well. Come close to you as well. In a relationship that will bless your life and bless your relationships. Now, now there is a, a, a there is a next teaching here. It's it's verse eight, the rest of verse eight, that also causes us to look at ourselves and admit something that we are not perfect, that we are not pure, that we do not have it all down, that there's no one can, who can say that all my relationships are fine and perfect and I'm always in control of my mouth and my attitudes. No one can say that. And so he wants us, another step, fourth one, is to be pure, inside and out. We need to be pure people. Verse 8 says, Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, the Jewish readers here, they're going to recognize this type of language. Jewish readers understand the very familiar requirement in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant that Old Testament priests had to wash themselves from head to toe before offering their sacrifices. They had to purify themselves, consecrate themselves, to be pure so they can go before the perfect God. Purity of body, purity of heart, purity of mind. uh, All of this is necessary if we are to be near to God. What keeps us from being near to God? What? You can say it. Sin. Your sin? Yeah, your sin. My sin. Meaning to take it. I'm not near to God because that person's mean to me. Or I don't like what that person says or believes about that one thing. No. It's our sin. And the sooner we accept that fact, the closer we can be to God and the purification that we need. Purity of body, purity of heart, uh, purity of mind, all of that. It's necessary through Christ so that we can be close to God. James calls these Christians sinners. I'll read it again. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He's not talking to the unsaved. He's not talking to the people of the world. He is writing to and speaking to the Christians who are sinful. He said it. He wrote it. I didn't. Now, what does this mean? Pure in body, pure in heart, pure in mind. It's necessary to stand in God's presence. He calls them sinners because through through their sins, even their forgiven sins, we have struggles in maintaining godly relationships when sin is, we're still under the influence of sin and even past forgiven sin. There's consequences to all of that. James also says that they are double-minded. Double-minded brings to mind that some Christians were only half-hearted in their commitment to the Lord. Half-hearted. It literally means, we already found out, James 1 verse 8, he uses this reference to to uh, being double-minded, it means a a double-minded, two-souled person, a person that cannot commit, cannot go all the way, one foot in the world and one foot in Christ, and trying to live that way, that type of person is unstable, tossed about like a, a, a wave in the sea. Instability. What happens when a Christian is 
sinful and unstable in their life in Christ. Is that going to bless their marriage? Is that going to make win them friends in the community? Is that going to, to help them in the relationships uh, in the body of Christ? Of course not. That stability comes when we are made pure by the Lord, when we are made pure by God. Number five, how do we view ourselves? We often, uh, bad relationships happen when we don't view ourselves in the right way. I've got nothing to repent of, perhaps. Yeah, things like that. I am not sinful. I don't have sins in my life. That uh, James knows, you know, I know that that's not true. What do we do? James says, well, how do you feel about your sins? How do you respond to your sins? In his culture, and, and, and mostly before this culture, when you were at odds with God or you knew that you were wrong or sinful and, and you were overtaken by, the, by grief, you would sit in a pile of ashes. You would put on the worst, scratchiest, horrible clothes you could and throw dust in the air. You were just so gr grief-stricken because of your life and your sins. What does he say? Verse 9. We must grieve for our sins. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, how do we put that? Are you sorry? Do, we, do you recognize it? And are you sorry enough to repent? Put this in a relational situation. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom and go to your friend and apologize. Or stand up in front of your church and say, I repent. Whatever. It's what God is demanding. My friends, we can't be close to God and submit to God's will and really flee the devil uh, like we need to and resist the devil like we should if we have a flippant attitude about our sins. Our sins should drive us to our knees before God. Brothers and sisters, if you have, if you have a quarrelsome and, and fight-filled marriage, you need to humble yourself to your spouse. You need to repent you need to repent. If you have relationships at work where you haven't stood up for Christ as you should and presented the proper um, view of a serious Christian, you need to, to weep and wail and mourn and ask for God's forgiveness. He's just trying to help the Christians here see that, listen, things are a mess because sin is in your life. I need to hear that. I am the cause of my own sin issues. You're not. Karen's not. Devil's not, I am in my life. That is the truth. And so think about it. David wrote this. What did, what did David feel about his sins? He wrote, Psalm 51, A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Broken and contrite heart. That's grieving for sin. But here's the deal. When you do this, God will graciously respond to you. Remember, He gives more grace. We've already read that in the preamble to this section. He gives more grace. What do we do? Verse 10, humble yourself before the Lord. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. What a good, gracious God we serve. Our sins, our ways, our things, the things that we mess up, even when I don't submit and I don't resist and I don't come and stay near and when I'm not pure inside and out like I should be and when I don't grieve as much for my sin as I need to be, but if I will humble myself before God, and that really is a, a, a word that means to fall down or be made low, fall to your knees, He will lift me up. When God lifts me up, then He'll bless my marriage and bless my friendships and bless my church family and bless my neighbors and my relationship with them. Now, the first six of those deal with the fact that our relationship with God matters in all relationships. 
And the last two um, things that he states, the last two, number seven and number eight in verse 11 and verse 12, all of this right here, these last two, these are our responses to God. And when we respond to God correctly, we're going to learn that there are two things that we can never have in our life. If they're in our life, they have to be gone. We can't go to them. They can't be something that we go to and use against other people. The first one is do not slander people. Slander, you know what that means? Don't slander. Verse 11, James writes, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. Slandering means this. It means to talk against a person in an ungodly way. That's the first definition. It, the intention of talking against someone in an ungodly way is to put them down so that you feel elevated yourself. We do that in various different ways. Here are the biblical ways. Well, they're the unbiblical ways, but we find these in the Word of God. We do this with slandering, as we said, with gossip, with lies, with putting people down, and even tearing people down. Don't slander. These are the things that we purposely do. You don't slander on accident, do you? Right? Do you gossip by accident? Not in general. Uh, do you lie on accident? No. Do we do these things and we can't help ourselves? No, none of that's true. So don't slander. The last one is this. And do not judge each other. Don't slander and don't judge. Verse 12. Now here is back. To, we're going full circle. Remember, we submit to God because God is God. Here, we submit to God because God is the judge. And we have nothing going for us where we can put ourselves in God's place on the judgment seat. I love that about God. He actually takes a big burden off of us in this. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, we need to remember that God alone has the authority to determine what is right and wrong. And only God, and through His Word, has the right and the authority to judge who? Who? is right and wrong. Don't put yourself in God's place in this. Jesus demanded it. God uh, demands it. James verifies it right here. So not only is James showing us how foolish it is to question God's laws about this, he also points out that we really, we have no credibility to judge anyone, our neighbor, nobody. Why? Why do we not have credibility to judge people? We're not perfect. We sin. We're not pure unless God purifies us. We don't read minds and hearts the way God knows everything about us. So we are in no place to do that. So since we are dependent on God's perfect judgments and on God's beautiful, wonderful grace and His Son for our salvation, who are we to condemn? We have no place in that. That is God's purview only. Let's read these again. Number one. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Come near to God. Be pure inside and out. Grieve for your sin. Humble yourself before God. Don't slander others. Don't judge each other. And when these eight wonderful, totally and completely achievable things are true in our lives, what are the blessings? Your marriage is going to be blessed. This church is going to be blessed. Your family is going to be blessed. The people you work with or go to school with or your neighbors, they are going to be blessed. All these blessings and relationships come when we begin by submitting ourselves to God. Don't let sinful pride get in the way of having a good, godly relationship. This is a blessing that God wants to give us. Let's stand. And we need to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful 
that you have so much grace for all of our problems. So, Father, bless us and help us, please, to have godly relationships as people who submit to your will and who resist the devil. Father, I pray that we will uh, be so thankful for your purification and you being near us that we will never slander and that we will never judge. Father, thank you for what you do for us and what you've given us in Christ. Father, I pray that you move anyone in this room that needs to repent, that needs prayers, or needs to put on Jesus and become his servant today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.